them. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to uh, invite up to the podium Jim Campbell. Thank you very much, um, Professor Hannah. Uh, absolute pleasure, and so so nice that you could introduce me as well. Um, Hanan and I have been working and building this relationship between the World Health Organization and Qatar University for a number of years now. Um, so good afternoon. I've got the graveyard slot after lunch. You know, I'm meant to be giving you pearls of wisdom um, and, you know, and trying to keep you energized and going through. What, what I was invited to do was give you a, a bit of a background from the WHO perspective. Many, of, I see lots of friendly faces that we've worked with for many, many years and some new faces here. But a WHO perspective around your, you know, the context of the health and care workforce and then to situate your work within that uh, and try to make that relevant. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a, a global overview the big sort of sustainable development goals issue. Bring that down then into what uh, John was talking about yesterday around the policy um, drivers, the policy implementation, and then bring it into the together, as we heard from Jill this morning, uh, uh, really looking at the, the role of all together better health, and indeed the role of the declaration that you've so kindly shared with us. Uh, and then we'll see, if hopefully, we'll still have time for some Q&A and get into the, the discussion. So, protocol observed for the, the purpose of the conference. Um, but I do have personal and professional uh, engagements with many of you, so uh, <laughs> we'll see if some of that, that unconscious bias comes out. We are ladies and gentlemen, at the halfway point of the Sustainable Development Goals. The end of June, 1st of July, we reached seven and a half years of the 15-year period. And in September, in New York, the United Nations General Assembly held three high-level meetings on health, on universal health coverage, on emergency preparedness and response, and on tuberculosis. And in their deliberations, they were looking at what has happened in the first seven and a half years, what do we need to be doing with that history, with that knowledge in the next phase. And just uh, uh, 48 hours before the high-level meetings in New York, represented by your ministers of foreign affairs, your heads of state, Ministers of Health, uh, the, the 2023 edition of the Global Monitoring Report on Universal Health Coverage was launched in New York. And what does it say? This is the, the, the overarching progress for the Sustainable Development Goals Health and Wellbeing in the Consolidated Index around Universal Health Coverage. The scorecard is alarming. For the first time since we've had records, life expectancy is in reverse. For the access to universal health coverage, the majority of countries have stagnated or regressed. They've gone backwards. Less people are accessing a universal package of care today than previously. For the financial protection index, more and more people are getting into financial hardship to access health services. This progress, this ambition of health for all, the ambition of better health and well-being is really, really um, a, a marker that we have to sort of consider is getting further and further away, not closer. And we've got many stories around the impact of COVID-19 on that. So what clearly, as Jill was saying, we have to do better. And what is better as we start to think that through? 
We've had for decades the evidence that there is a correlation between people, the number of people you have in your health and care system, and your population health outcomes. It's intuitive, you know, without people, how do you, how do you access care? Where do you go for your treatment? Not a, you know, Google has only been around for a little while in terms of asking the Google doctor, you know, but we're, you know, you've got to ask people. So we've seen this correlation and it holds constant. The latest evidence confirms again. Those countries with a minimum density of health and care workforce are achieving far better population health outcomes and they're achieving on the right hand side here much better scores on the health emergency preparedness and protection agenda. So if we talk about universal health coverage and health security, emergency preparedness and response, people make the difference and that's the business you're in the education and practice of the people in the health and care workforce. That's part of your role, how do we do better? And everyone knows, however, that we don't have enough people. Uh, that we're in a world of resource constraints, we're in a world of people constraints. And yet, the data, the evidence, tells us that we've got more health and care workers than at any other time in history. More health and care workers today than ever before. We heard yesterday the presentation, the history of health in Qatar, and how you've accelerated in a period of 70 to 100 years your health and care system. And that's replicated in many settings and jurisdictions around the world. Whilst we're here in Qatar, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has launched their report for 2023, Health at a Glance, in Paris yesterday. Again, they're saying exactly the same thing. More health and care workers than ever before, but guess what? They're not equitably distributed around the world. So we see here shortages existing today from a WHO perspective on universal health coverage, but shortages exist in every economy. It's a relative measure. But some of those shortages, if you look at the middle bars that we have here, some of those shortages are going to be more and more concentrated in the eastern Mediterranean region of WHO and the African region of WHO. What we're seeing in Southeast Asia, they've, they've ramped up their education and their employment, and they're anticipating to reduce their shortage in the next seven and a half years considerably. Africa and EMRA will have the greatest shortages. This region, your influence, the new Arab network that we're hearing about has a role to play. Let's come away from those regional averages and look at which countries. And a word of warning, whenever you talk about shortages, whenever you hear the mention about shortages, in what context, in what perspective? Because you can look at this in so many different ways. Is it an absolute shortage in terms of total numbers of workers? Certain countries will end up in a, in a listing, in a ranking of greatest shortage. Is it specific to a geographical area? The middle column here, looking at the small island developing states. And Bahrain, one of your neighbors here in Qatar, you know, starts to appear in that list from a geographical or um, grouping classification of countries. And on the right-hand side, we're looking at those countries with a particular shortage, which is the greatest in terms of relative to population and a different grouping of countries appears. So you've got to ask the question, how are you measuring shortage against what, in what context, to really understand that. If you go to, to France, if you go to Germany, if you go to America, they will tell you about their shortages compared to the demand for population services. Yeah, so it's always, always, always question what shortage where and doing what. Hanan mentioned in the, the very kind remarks 
that when we come to talk about people, there are some things that really uh, should be at the, the, in every conversation that we have. And that's about protecting the worker. Uh, and so through the COVID-19 pandemic, we looked at what, you know, not just the numbers, but the quality of the work experience. And what was the impact on health and care workers against their personal lives, against their mental health, against their physical health, against their rights. Health workers have rights. Sometimes we forget them, yeah, but they do have rights as employees, as labor contributors. And we looked at all these issues and just some headline data that we have up there. We estimate from the evidence available from member states reporting to WHO at least 115,000 health workers lost their lives during COVID-19. Serving us, protecting us, put themselves into difficulty, into harm's way, and lost that period. More than a third suffered moral injury, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts um, throughout that period as this workload uh, came upon them. 60% plus experienced workplace violence. The stigma of being a health worker and the, the anti-vaccination campaigns that we have seen around the world targeted against individual workers. You know, these are the work, the experience of work that these people are suffering. We'll come back to some of this in a minute. Um, the same people are operating, and, and it's, it's what Jill was talking about as well, around resilience. The same people are operating in some health systems. You know, for every 100 population, there may be one health worker. In the con next country, there will be 10 health workers for every 100 population. You know, there's this huge difference between national capacity. And yet we expect the same therapists, the same physicians, the same pharmacists to perform in a context where the capacity is already minimized. So always understand the issues around the people. And they will, if those pressures upon them are such that they start to question the professional workplace, the professional remuneration, the satisfaction that they got, these are tertiary educated people who will look at other career development opportunities around the world. Migration during the COVID-19 pandemic is at an all-time global high. More people are moving to, cr to take up these health and care jobs in other jurisdictions, other sovereign states than ever before. And so what we managed to achieve with the World Health Assembly was to put the health worker at the center, the health and care worker at the center. And ministers of health have endorsed um, the evidence around how do we protect health and care workers, what's called a global health and care worker compact. And this is so very relevant. If you look up in uh, the green right quadrant, protection from attacks on health facilities and health workers, protection from violence. We have to look no further than the news, uh, Google feeds, uh, the situation that's unfolding in Gaza, the situation around the world in other protracted conflicts. You know, health workers should be free from violence in the workplace, full stop. Any transgression should be called out for that. And WHO is very, very clear. Attacks on health facilities, health workers are not uh, acceptable. But this looks at all the other protections as well, the legal protections, the occupational health and safety protections, the gender protections, freedom from sexual harassment in the workplace. Freedom from discrimination on any base of age or race or ethnicity. And really requires employers, often the government, but mainly increasingly so the private sector employers, 
in many regions of the world are now the biggest providers of health services. They have an obligation to protect the worker. And unmentioned, we looked in particular at the mental health, the moral injury, the distress during the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of this. And we emphasized again as WHO with the Qatar University, with the World Innovation Summit for Health here in Qatar, we had the patron, Her Highness Sheikha Moza, with her yesterday. Um, the, the duty of care that is bestowed upon all of us to protect workers from these incidents. Tomorrow we have a keynote address from Dr. Anan uh, Hakir, yeah? the on mental health and stigma in, in the workplace. And really some of those messages absolutely critical. So that's the big picture context. Global stagnation, regression around access to care and affordability, workforce shortages, workforce protection. What can we do? What can we do to do something better? We have set out as WHO with the World Bank and many different experts, the collaborating centers, a very simplified process looking at the education market and the labor market in health and care. We are one of the fastest growing labor sectors in the world. And the OECD report yesterday from Paris confirming again the latest statistics coming out of the high income OECD countries, 30%, 40% growth projected in health and care in the next seven to 10 years. We need to get that in a managed way. So we're a, a, a labor sector, an economic sector, which has all these benefits and dividends to impact. But to make that labor sector functional, to try and get from an economic perspective uh, a greater efficiency and effectiveness into this market, we have policy levers. And policy levers that can impact our education, the quality, the quantity, the accreditation, the licensing, the regulation, the practice environment that we can come further forward and make sure that we're constantly looking towards those population health outcomes, putting people at the center of our health and care systems, putting their livelihoods, their health and well-being at the center and trying to get an impact for them. And so just a few of the policy instruments that you can use. We have a global strategy on human resources for health. You, uh, John put it up in one of his slides with some of the reference documents and materials. That talks about your business. That talks about education, employment, interprofessional education, collaborative practice. We took that evidence from your work and made sure it was going in to the, the policy document that ministers of health endorse in Geneva. Use it. It's there to enable, infuse, engage you in your work. Similarly, the resolution on working for health, the role of people in practice, really talks about this education into employment market and how to get it to really come further forward for population outcomes. If we disaggregate some of the education elements that are in these documents, we really look at planning education and doing it well, governing that process, uh, and then sort of forming the policy to come further forward. We believe in educating for primary health care. What Jill was saying, her wish list this morning, that's actually an evidence-based approach. It's not just wishful thinking. The evidence is in favor of those approaches. Keeping people out of hospital, treating them in the community, educating for that dividend. And what we've added to recently all those planning approaches is an evidence base around competency-based education. Um, and it's wonderful, uh, and Siobhan is here, Siobhan Fitzpatrick, who led the work on the competency-based education. Siobhan. Um, a very long, thorough, detailed process looking at all the, the competency-based frameworks around the world that we could identify, beyond those in English, Jill. Um, we managed to get a few other languages in there as well. 
deconstructing those and then reconstructing. Where's this commonality? What are the common frameworks? And it's great to see Jill and John referencing these materials. We make them available to, to guide your work. So please do use them. And we've put in there this whole consensus, international consensus around education to drive not just the individual competencies but the practice activities, which hopefully gives us the behavior change that we need in our public health, in our community health, in our hospitals, in our tertiary systems. And one of the six core competencies that are universal for all occupations, collaborative practice, your business, what you do <laughs> as professions, as professionals, collaborative practice, and making sure that the underpinning professional education, interprofessional education, is driving that behavioral change, nudging people to look at how they make a difference, nudging people to go into that. That really, again, um, thank you very much for those who all contributed in the, the Doha Declaration to the expert group. I can see a few faces in the audience who are part and parcel of this expert work. Thank you very much. It's, uh, WHO is a, a, an organization that it benefits from your knowledge, your experience, your evidence to produce these public goods. Also within this, the whole principle of social accountability and how we need to underpin education. You as educators, your outcome, your key performance indicator is not how many people you graduate. Your key performance indicator is what's their contribution to population health. What's their contribution to the community they serve? What's your contribution to retention? Do your graduates end up earning the most money in health? Or do your graduates end up saving the most lives and improving health and well-being? How you measure yourself as a university, as a, an educational institution makes a difference in how those professions, those professionals will impact the S sustainable development goals, population health and well-being. So we need to drive that process. Um, bringing it back closer then to home. We have at WHO a mechanism with member states where they report annually on their health and care workforce to WHO against the standard structure. It's called a national health workforce account. Now the reporting is a byproduct of the real purpose, which is to strengthen the administrative capacity of the public sector to report on the health and care workforce, to know what's happening, your graduate numbers, your production, your education capacity, your employment, your retention, your attrition, um, to come forward to inform policy decisions between the education sector and the health and care sector and make sure that they're connected. And one of the indicators that we ask member states to really look at is around interprofessional education and practice. And so this is a quick snapshot of which member states are reporting to us that there is a policy, there is a, a structure of interprofessional education that exists. Now, some of these countries would reflect the audience today uh, in terms of the participation in ATBH, but there are other countries that are also indicating, saying we have interprofessional education as a measure. But guess what? It may exist, but is it having the impact it's, it's meant to be having on the workplace, on the practice, on the behavior. Uh, and if not, we've got a big question. At least it's a, a, a signal, and we're trying to drive that for, to enable you to use this data to go and have those policy discussions. 
Are we meeting the standards? Are we meeting the quality? Similarly, the policy that we have, evidence and guidance on education to get equity, rural distribution. We don't just want to be universities that, that produce workers for the tertiary sector, the shiny hospital in the capital. We want workers who are going to be in the community, strengthening public health, driving primary health care services, ensuring that we've got equitable access uh, across the life course for the essential services that exist. And education is a key issue. So as educators in IPE, how do you link to the policy around rural distribution? How can your work around collaborative practice also support equitable distribution to come further forward? Um, Hanan mentioned the work on public health, and I really, I was saying this to the interprofessional.global board yesterday. We need to go beyond clinical workforce. It's not only the regulated professions in health, but we need to go into the care workforce, we need to go into the public health workforce, which expands across different government sectors. Who's responsible for social determinants of health in your country? Who's responsible for nutrition, for poverty, for water, for sanitation? Who's ensuring yeah, that people have that, that equal access to the basic provisions of the social contract? And are they working with your clinicians? Are they working with your physicians, your pharmacists, to really expand public health? And this piece of work is an opportunity for your group as educators to really look at, we can, just, you know, we can increase the depth of our work, but we can increase the breadth and bring some of those other occupational groups in. QU, what you're doing here, and Dr. Alla, you know, it's phenomenal in terms of the, the work across the, the pr licensed professions. Where are your public health people? Are they at the table with you? You need to make sure they are. We've set out very similar process, understand functions, understand competencies, map and measure to really drive that process. I'd love to see as many of your countries represented here in the meeting picking this work up and integrating it with your clinical services. So the final slide to bring it back to ATBH. WHO for the last couple of years has had a very clear campaign around the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, the International Year of Health and Care Workers, the resolutions in the World Health Assembly protecting, safeguarding, and investing in the health and care workforce. And we've run that campaign under three sort of headline words, protect, invest, together. So the protect agenda we've talked about, these are people. These are people who are doing their utmost. We've got to protect them from the workplace issues. We've got to make sure that we're the system, the employer is ensuring that they are protected. It's not about individual resilience. It's about the system capacity and the moral obligation, the legal obligation, the employer's obligation to protect the worker. If I fail, as a nurse after doing a 70-hour a week for the last five weeks, six weeks, it's not because there's no resilience, it's because the system has failed the individual worker. We need to insist on that. We need to invest. We need to invest, and you can see, education, employment, and evidence. Your business. That's what WHO is saying. Invest in your business. Education, employment, evidence. We want to see the graduate numbers hitting between 8 to 12% of the workforce stock so that we expand the human capital in the system, we expand the domestic supply, we create a workforce that is going to be protected. These are people coming through your education institutions. We need to ensure that then they get jobs. 
uh, to go with it. And the together piece really again speaks to ATBH. The together piece is this is all health and care workers. 20 years ago, we used to talk about doctors and nurses and not a lot more, occasionally midwives. Uh, now we're looking at a range of about 180 different occupations that together are responsible for the delivery of universal health coverage and health security. And it's how those teams, the professional teams, the workers that enable and support those professional teams come together as a whole with academic support, clinical governance support that will make the difference. Those countries that are making progress against UHC and health security are those that are actively driving that agenda. And I ask you all, you know, if you take away Jill challenged, what, what's the evaluation outcome? What's the learning? I ask you all as you go back and reflect in your settings, in your jurisdictions, what's your role as educators to bring people together to inform practice? Thank you very much. Do you want to do that one? Go, go, hold on. Okay. Uh, so just a very, very small change in plans. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Jim. This was amazing, and I anticipate a lot of questions for that. But before we take the questions, and as you uh, prepare them, it's my sincere honor to hand this uh, trophy to Jim. I hope you make it back here several times to keep updating us on these exciting developments, including the roadmap. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Ah, that's going to take pride of place in Geneva. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much to Jim. I'm going to uh, handle the question and answers. Dr. Hanan has had to uh, leave for another appointment. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for highlighting the importance of public health. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and when you ask the question, are public health people at the IPE sessions at Khartoum University, we can proudly say yes. <laughs> yes, they are. We are there. So questions from the audience. Oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dr. Lily O'Hara. I'm the chair of the organizing committee and uh, associate professor of public health here at Qatar University. Probably all a bit sick of seeing me by now. <laughs> uh, so okay, questions. The first question is from okay, here. Okay, first question here. Can you introduce yourself sure. first? Thank I'm, you. I'm uh, Dr. Nasin al an MD from Istanbul. Uh, I'm Turkish, uh, I'm Syrian with a Turkish nationality. So the question is the following. Um, since we said protection, Tell actions are taken as an individuals. How can we, or what can we do to protect ourselves in, in clinics? What is the thing that we can do? Tell actions are actually taken on, on reality. Okay. Um, the, the Global Health and Care Worker Compact has got the endorsement of the World Health Assembly. 197 ministers from around the world. It sets out those measures that should be standard in every jurisdiction with every employer. Use that evidence. It, it's it's a quite a simple checklist. Do you have protection against X? Do you have protection against Y? Are you allowed to have collective bargaining? Are you protected against uh, zero contract hours or zero contract, zero hour contracts? 
etc., etc. Use that. Work with your association. Work with your council, with your regulators, to actually say, let's have a dialogue and get that, and then document. Evidence is powerful. Employment, educa education, employment, evidence. Evidence, evidence. And engage with us. If you find something that's not there, if it's got a big X, come back to us. But the issue that goes beyond that is that it may exist in regulation, but there's a practice gap. But again, work with your association, your stakeholders, raise the dialogue and the debate, and publish. Publish, publish, publish. If you, if you see a gap, get it, the evidence into the public domain, because we will respond if we see it in the public domain. I think that's a really important point about um, the, the states actually signing that agreement. And I think a lot of people don't realise that that actually has an legal obligation then on those states to, to enact um, whatever, whatever agreement is signed uh, within that system. Yeah. I think a lot of people think it's just a kind of advisory thing, but it's an actual regulatory yeah. piece, uh, process. Mm. Okay, great. Next up, right at the front here. Uh, got, yes, you have the microphone. Uh, thank you for your can you, would you Can you speak a little louder, sorry? Make sure the microphone's on, just push it up. And speak right into the microphone. It, it would have been on. Yeah, it's on. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm Dr. Nabil Almir. I'm the Dean for College of Nursing. I've been in nursing for a very long time in the service, and I am, I am in education. Um, when, you, when we are looking at the workforce planning, uh, like Qatar, if I look at Qatar, uh, we have work, workforce planning was done based on patient care hours, acuity level of the patient, and, and according to the uh, report of WHO, we are very high in, um, in number of workforce according to the population. But after uh, COVID-19, it's difficult to, to, to have accurate numbers or accurate percentage because of migration of these nurses to other countries, especially Europe and United States. Um, so it's changing. Yes, uh, Qatar is trying their best to recruit more nurses, but the, you know, the, the stability of of this changing in, in the world, especially in Qatar, I can say that like every year we have to recruit more than 1,000 nurses because of the nurses are migrating to other countries. So how do you uh, come up with the accurate number to show it internationally how the countries are doing when you are looking at the EMRO? Yeah. So just to, I mean, this is a critical point, it comes to the issue about shortage and and asking for the clarification, the context. Yeah, yeah. So what the, the World Health Organization measures is the population universal health coverage service index. And what we see is that countries achieving 80% population coverage tend to have this bigger workforce, this density of a workforce. And so countries below that we articulate as having a shortage. But if your ambition is 90% coverage, 100% coverage, as in Qatar, for your population, you need, you still have shortages, you still have needs beyond that. So the WHO evidence base is purely to highlight those who are furthest behind. It's not about your needs for universal health coverage in Qatar. So we, we can help you articulate that in a way for your planning purposes. But then, right, turnover, attrition, retention, stability. M mobility and migration is real, and as I said, it's the, at the highest ever levels that we've recorded internationally. So you need to oversupply your workforce to accept that you will have career choices in your workforce that may mean moving from public sector to private sector, moving jurisdiction, moving internationally. You have to plan for that. Put more people into your supply to accommodate some of those migration pathways. Great. Can't quite see. Any more questions? 
I have a question for you. A lot of the people are thinking of theirs. So WHO does produce these excellent evidence-based um, tools and public goods. And as you've alluded to, the, the problem is in contextualization and implementation at the local level. So does who have a role, do you think, in actually supporting that process of contextualizing to the local level? So we, local yeah. Level? I mean, through the, through the networks that we work with, um, we produce some of the evidence base, but we also support, at the request of governments, any technical assistance uh, that may be requested. So to come into a country and help go through a very simple model, um, which is the four Ds. Here's a, here's a pearl of wisdom. <laughs> the four Ds. Data, dialogue, decision, dollar. Uh, so you want the, the investment as the result of the decision that's made. Data, dialogue, decision. And so we, we help stakeholders go through that process. Right. What's the evidence base for policy? What are the stakeholder perspectives? What's the policy decision from the, the governing body? And then will there be a budget to implement that decision? Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Okay. Any other questions? Such an important and incredible, um, incredible one, piece of work. Lots of work, not one piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Dalake. I'm uh, from the College of Nursing at Qatar University. Actually, it's uh, more like uh, an, uh, a comment, not a question. And uh, could you please uh, elaborate? So I liked uh, when you mentioned. Uh, including other uh, professions and fields such as public health and uh, other. Um, we could think about uh, stretching the, the limits and boundaries for interprofessional education to include uh, uh, other things and uh, to extend the definition of health into one health, which is a commonly known definition, to include three circles, not one, so one circle include or uh, uh, represents human being, but then we should think about the health of animals and interaction with uh, human beings, transmission of infection between animals and human beings, and the third circle which talks about uh, uh, plants. So these three th uh, circles represent three different fields, but they are interacting with each other, which is commonly known as one health and there are many countries and uh, universities are pioneer in this field. And one of them, the one that I uh, already experienced is, is uh, University of uh, Nebraska at Lincoln. They have a great center uh, for One Health. I fully support yes. Uh, yes. and please speak with Hanan who's been on the expert group for WHO looking at these issues. We, we fully support the principle. We, we shouldn't divide mm. disease, aging, reproductive health. We're planning for a team of people that can do all of that, including the One Health and the public health issues. Exactly. Mm. Any other questions? Because I do have another one, if no one else does. This ah, one? yes, up here, just in the blue can, shirt. Can yes. you hear me? Is this clear? Oh, Stand yeah. up and introduce yourself, oh. please. Uh, hi, doctors. I'm Nidal. I'm a fifth-year medical student in Qatar University. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you guys have any real-life examples of how implementing these policies in health practice today have actually made a difference in how the practice of healthcare is. So, like, after implementing these policies, have you guys really seen any change based on these evidences that you talked about today? Or any real-life examples, any country that came across your mind? So yes, part, part of the work that we do with governments all over the world is to, to do both the policy tracing, so what was the policy decision, and then to measure the results, the impact of those policy decisions. Um, I, I can think of many examples, but you know, the, what we're looking for is, is a re result of the workforce scale up, that we see additional investment in education in terms of the cohort size very measurable, you know, number of education institutions, number of schools. 
to see the connection between the budget for wages to be able to employ those people and absorb them into the workplace. Mm. And then the quality indicators around practice outcomes, yeah. which every country measures anyway. Uh, but at the aggregate level, but what's really interesting is when you see social accountability and interprofessional education and practice at a local level. You know, so you go down into the, the, the province of or the county of, and you actually see within two to three years, immediate improvement in access to services and health outcomes. That's the measure of success that we're most interested mm. in, not yeah. the global aggregate. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay, just curious, the roadmap that you referred to earlier, does it include IPE as a competency? Collaborative practice, Collaborative practice. as a competency. Yeah. So that's the, that, again, this, we're looking at the output. Yeah. Interprofessional education yep. is the mechanism to get, and that's what we, we want to measure, the collaborative practice competency. Yep. And so by default, we're not saying you must do interprofessional mm. education, but you're not going to get it without exactly. it. <laughs> so WHO <laughs> is advocating for the mechanism to give us that outcome. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, Maggie Gerard from Canada. I was wondering, uh, do you have any pearls of wisdom for policymakers or government that wants to make the most of their current competent healthcare workforce and use them to their full scope of competence rather than counting the number of titles? If we, let, let Jill's example, if we want all together better health, then scope of practice and practicing to, to competence, practicing to license, practicing to regulation, to the education is going to be essential. We see far too many people working below their scope of practice because of the sort of traditional hierarchy of the issue. And, and I was chatting with, with Champion la last night, um, your, your, your chair of your board. It's, the, you know, we're producing on average, the education is producing about four, five, six percent new graduates that go into the workforce. So you're producing four, five, six percent, but the workforce, 94, 95 percent, these people's ability to influence, you know, less than one in 10, one in 20, uh, you're trying to influence the be their behavior. So we've got to come back to scope, license, regulation, and flexibility. We'll, we've got a workshop this afternoon where we'll, we'll go into a bit more depth on the scope of practice and regulation discussion. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, okay. Seeing you standing and you've got the mic in your hand. This is the last okay, one. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, Cornelia from Germany. Um, just one comment more than anything else. One thing which really struck my mind, which I thought is a take-home message for me as an educator, is basically to educate more on systems than on, um, at a very early stage, to, to, to get that system thinking into our students. And it was, uh, uh, um, but Sylvia Langloyle yesterday also mentioned that and kind of struck my mind. I thought that kind of fitted in and I just had to say that here. Thank you. So. Totally agree. Fully agree and I can see other people clapping. Health <laughs> systems, health <laughs> workforce, yes. Well, whole systems, <laughs> not even just health, yes. Okay, thank you very much for this fantastic session. Thank you, Jim.